My name is Jacek Bartosia. Welcome to Strategy and Future. Hello everyone, welcome to another Strategy and Future podcast. My name is Albert Świdziński, I'm the Director of Analysis of Strategy and Future. With me is the founder uh, of the company, Jacek Bartoszek, and we have a very special guest today, and Louis Vincent Gaff. Uh, Louis, thank you for so much for, for joining us today. Um, Thanks for having me. Louis, thank, thank you very you. much, Albert. Thanks, Jacek. Thanks. Uh, delighted to be here. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll just introduce Louis briefly. Louis is uh, Louis was born in France, but he lived for many decades now in in Hong Kong. Uh, he's the CEO of Gafco, which is a financial services firm that offers institutional investors and high net worth individuals three different services: fund management, independent research, and global macroeconomic trends and events as well as independent, and that is, I think, particularly interesting for us, independent advisory work in China and its impact on the global economy. And Louis has recently, along with the, I believe, father of yours, uh, right. Charles, uh, published a book entitled Clash of Empires, Currencies and Power in a Multipolar World, which both Jacek and myself found extremely informative. Um, thank you. So again, th thank you so yeah. much for being here. And in order to add uh, the, regarding your book, uh, we reviewed it in uh, at Strategy in Future. So it's uh, right a quite widely known publication in Poland and Central <laughs> Eastern Europe, much. where we are having quite an impact and reach uh, among our sub subscribers. So for you to know, thank you so much, very much appreciate it. And if we may kick off, uh, I will ask you, you know, a direct question. Uh, your book, Clash of Empires, is uh, beautifully written, connecting two seemingly uh, w different separate worlds, geopolitics and world finance. Uh, I find it perfect. I, I, I find it brilliant in that respect. And uh, what changed between the moment when you finished writing this book and uh, this day as we speak, speak today? What would what would what would have changed? What would you say have, has changed in the meantime, in your perception on the world events? That's uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, being based uh, in Hong Kong, so our firm uh, is headquartered in Hong Kong. We have we have an office in Beijing, so um, our you know our view tends to be very uh, you know China China driven, um, given where we sit. Um, and you know, I think if you look at uh, at the past year. China's had to deal with uh, with three major challenges. Um, the first challenge has been the uncertainty surrounding Hong Kong and uh, and the riots uh, there. Uh, the, the second big challenge for China has been uh, the surge in the price of pork following the the African swine flu, which is uh, basically you know the, the price of pork in China has more than doubled, and that has unleashed um, uh, you know. Decent inflation across the board in China. You now have four and a half percent inflation. Um, the third big change, of course, were all the the back and forth on on the trade war, uh, which uh, which now seems to to be over. Now, of course, uh, you know the the book uh, Clash of Empires, as you can tell from the title, is really about the the evolution of the U.S. Chinese relationship. Um, and when I, when you know when we wrote the book, uh, it really felt as if China. Um, was basically had sort of decided that uh, it didn't really want to cooperate with the U.S. Uh, I think if you go back to the genesis of the, the trade war, so President Trump gets elected, and President Trump is fundamentally a mercantilist. And so he, uh, he makes a lot of noise about how the, the U.S.-China uh, trade balance is just uh, way too out of whack and that needs to come in. And, you know, if you go back to the history, initially – China responds to this uh, with a fairly open mind. Um, China's response is basically, look, uh, let's meet up and you tell us what to buy and we'll bring the checkbook. Um, but what happens is behind President Trump, you have a number of guys, uh, you know, Vice President Mike Pence, uh, Mike Pompeo, John Bolton, uh, who sort of engage themselves into the breach uh, uh, created by Donald Trump. And for them, The issue isn't as much the trade balance as China's rise as a rival superpower. Um, and with that, the trade war starts to evolve into a tech war. 
the U.S. says, well, look, we're instead of uh, we're going to uh, prevent you, we're going to prevent ZTE, we're going to prevent Huawei from buying uh, semiconductors from us. Um, and at that point, China backs off. Um, and it looks, and this was when we were writing the book, it looks like we were heading for basically a full-on confrontation. Um, I think the two crises that we've had uh, in the meantime in uh, in China, the other two crises, namely the uh, the pork crisis and the, uh, the Hong Kong crisis, um, has raised the awareness in China that they can't uh, completely cut themselves off from the U.S. Um, and so, you know, I think on both sides, both the U.S. and the Chinese side, there was there was more of an uh, a willingness to compromise, at least for the near term, as they each deal with their own respective issues. In the U.S., uh, obviously, the election in uh, in China, the need to import a lot of food, the need to calm the situation uh, down in Hong Kong. Um, that brings us to today. I think if you look at uh, right now, you can expect uh, probably uh, fairly little uh, in terms of tensions between China and the U.S. for the coming year. Uh, but after the presidential election, who knows who knows what will happen? Um, I'll just um, um, I'll just finish uh, on on this point by by highlighting that. Uh, China, of course, is now dealing with a fourth crisis uh, with this uh, coronary virus. Uh, it's triggering sell-offs in markets, etc. Uh, but this should be just a, a short-term, uh, a short-term crisis. Uh, you know, the fears of pandemic that uh, you know China used to have in the past, I think, are today way overblown because sanitation, because healthcare. Because uh, hygiene in China is, you know, drastically better than it's been uh, than at any time in its history. Um, longer term, the question remains, of course, uh, that China and the U.S. are now very clearly rival geostrategic powers, but their economies are more integrated than even two allies have ever been. Uh, so this is a historical anomaly to have this level of economic integration uh, and yet geostrategic rivalry at the same time. Um, I think both countries, both the U.S. and China, realize that this is an anomaly. And the trend of the next 10 years will be for this economic integration to gradually disintegrate and for each uh, geostrategic uh, power to go its own way. Um, the question for investors is, does this happen very quickly, uh, in which case you get massive disruption to global growth and massive disruption to financial markets? Or does this happen slowly and gradually over time? And I think... You know, the, the signing of the phase one uh, trade deal uh, can lead you to believe that it'll happen slowly and gradually without creating havoc for the global economy or global markets, which is, of course, a positive development. Louis, you've likened the, the tech war that, that seemingly China has, has decided to pick or was in a, in a position, you know, an avoidable position to pick with, with the U.S. as uh, Agincourt. I pardon my pronunciation here, uh, redux, the, the repeat, uh, in a sense that the U.S. considers itself very much like the uh, the French heavy riders, the heavy cavalry, uh, to be uh, cream of the crop. Yep. And the Chinese, um, Chinese are feeling that they can, in fact, challenge, uh, challenge uh, the U.S. And it seems, and again, the, the very... And, First of all, would you agree that, for example, Huawei, as you as you mentioned, would you say that this is the vanguard of of uh, Chinese expansion, and it's also a one that really offers uh, tremendous promise to, to people who to countries, states that uh, adopt this technology or, or allow it to be to be used? And is there a, so that is the, the question number one. Question number two: How do you view? Um, the tech war evolving, especially looking that you know China has in 2018, I think, uh, imported uh, semiconductor. The net worth of semiconductors imported into China was was higher than than oil. Yeah, um, twice as much. It's twice twice as much. Yeah? So, so, how do you view this? Uh, how do you see this progressing? And 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 how important is tech for China as a tool of expanding its influence? Yeah, look, I think these are these are very, very important questions. And obviously, this will remain very fluid. But, um, do, you know, I think if we go back to the genesis of the of the tech war, the tech war really starts when um, China decides, tells Huawei and ZT, look, you can't buy semiconductors here anymore. Um, and China, 
just uh, realizes uh, all of a sudden that uh, it has a massive weakness in its expansion plan, and that is reliance on uh, on foreign countries, for, and most notably the U.S., but also Taiwan, Korea, Japan, um, for semiconductors. Um, and you know, I think until now, China's uh, geostrategic thinking was mostly that its its main uh, weakness was its reliance on uh, foreign commodities. Um, you know that he needed to uh, uh, get the iron ore from Australia. That he needed to get the oil from the Middle East. Um, and so China's geostrategic thinking was really, and if you look at the One Belt One Road as an example, it was really uh, about you know how can we ensure uh, continuous supply of commodities to feed to feed our growth. Uh, and I think semiconductors were sort of forgotten, uh, and all of a sudden they had a wake up call. The U.S. saying, "Look, we're not going to l- allow semiconductors to be sold to you anymore." And China realized that actually, yeah, they import uh, on any given year almost twice as much in semiconductors as they import in oil. So it's a, it's a huge, huge component. And you know, since then, what you've seen in the past couple of years is obviously China trying to deal with this weakness. So China has been pouring tens of billions of dollars into building domestic fabs and into trying to. Uh, you know, replace foreign semiconductors with with homemade ones. Um, in the short term, of course, this has led to a big increase in capital spending in the semiconductor space. So a lot of the equipment manufacturers like Advantest or ASM or uh, Tokyo Electron have, have done very, very well out of this. Um, over the longer term, it probably means that uh, if you're a semiconductor producer, uh, the bad news is now very soon you'll have a Chinese competitor, um, a Chinese competitor who you know doesn't really have to worry uh, about uh, making profits because uh, he'll be s- uh, supported by the Chinese government, for whom uh, maintaining a strong semiconductor domestic industry will be almost a matter of national security. Um, bottom line, uh, to uh, to to answer your question. Uh, the tech war is here, uh, and that part I don't think uh, is stopping. Um, we may we may have called a truce uh, in the short term, but the reality is I think over the long term the U.S. is now very uncomfortable that it depends a lot on computer parts, on PCBs and uh, motherboards and the like, on pieces that come out of China. Uh, just as China is, is increasingly uncomfortable about being dependent on the U.S. for for its uh, semiconductors, so I think you're going to see uh, basically supply lines uh, being uh, built uh, elsewhere and massive redundancies being put in the system. Um, I look at this as actually being fairly bearish for technology because you know technology was probably the most productive, most efficient, uh, most globally integrated supply lines of any industry. You know, I think if you take an iPhone for example, I think you've got parts from something like. 21 different countries. Uh, if we now now if we now need to start breaking up the entire supply chain to have a China supply chain and a U.S. supply chain, it obviously increases costs, it increases capital spending, uh, and it reduces productivity quite dramatically. Um, so you know the reality is, I look at the tech war as as being bearish for for technology. It, it is now the technology space is the battlefield uh, in the battle between China and the U.S. Uh, and in general rule, you uh, you don't want to own the battlefield. As uh, you know, you guys you guys are, are from Poland, so you know this well. Being uh, being the battlefield is no good. Um, it's definitely not a bullish development. Yeah, very interesting what you're saying. So, uh, from what you're saying, I gather that uh, the, the, the next decade will be marked by the growing, increasing competi- geostrategic competition between China and the US. And, uh, and the tech front will be uh, most uh, acute, most important. And, uh, and, and you have mentioned the weaknesses that China is, is having. What sort of weaknesses the United States is, uh, is having and facing? What is your take on that? Yes, uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, look, the United States, uh, you know, if, if you were playing cards, the United States kind of has pocket aces, right? Um, it has... Uh, first, a terrific geographical position where it can't be invaded by anybody. It only really has two borders and, and fundamentally only one because the border with Canada is a very, very safe border. Uh, so it only really, really has a border with Mexico. 
uh, compare that with China. I think China has borders with 14 different countries. Um, it's um, so, you know, just the geographical uh, situation. Then if you look at commodities, obviously the U.S. is now energy self-sufficient. It's agriculturally self-sufficient. Uh, it's, you know, it's basically, you know, name any commodities uh, and it's uh, and you can find it in the U.S. And if you can't find enough of it in the U.S., usually you find enough of it in Canada just next door. So in terms of, I would say, natural attributes, uh, the U.S. really stands alone uh, as anywhere in the world for the for the massive comparative advantages that it has. Um, so that's on the on the positive ledger uh, on the negative ledger. I think the, uh, you know, the, the one negative you could uh, highlight for the U.S. today uh, is basically runaway government spending and massive, massive unfunded pension liabilities. Um, and on this note, you know, for the past 10 years, uh, people have been saying how China uh, was going to face what's called a Minsky moment. Basically, the moment when because of excess debt, uh, the system starts to choke. Um, you can't roll over the debt anymore. And the, um, uh, the central bank has to come in, uh, intervene, and that usually tanks your currency. Um, a lot of investors have been looking at the growth of debt in China, have been waiting for the Minsky moment in China for the past decade. Uh, and really, you know, we've argued in our research that uh, it's not waiting for Minsky, it's really waiting for Godot, that the Minsky moment in China just doesn't come. Um, instead, what's been interesting is what, while everybody was looking for a debt crisis in China, uh, while everybody was looking east, uh, you had a debt crisis of sort uh, in the U.S. just a, a few months ago, back in September, when the U.S. repo markets froze. Um, and, you know, the repo markets, I don't want to get too technical, but the repo markets are basically at the core of the plumbing of the, of the U.S. financial system. Uh, and when the repo markets freeze, it basically means that um, commercial banks are no longer able to take – U.S. Treasuries and give you uh, give you cash, and uh, the reason I think U.S. Treasuries were no longer able to to basically take U.S. Treasuries and give and give cash uh, is that they were already too bloated with uh, with Treasuries, uh, and they were too bloated with Treasuries because the issuance of uh, U.S. government bonds has really gone into hyperdrive. Um, you know, today the U.S. government comes out into the market and borrows 5.6 billion dollars every single day. So every single day, the 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 U.S. Treasury needs to find people to buy 5.6 billions worth of Treasuries. What we saw in September is that there was nobody there to do it, uh, and so there was really little uh, choice for the but for the Fed to come in and buy all these U.S. Treasuries that the U.S. government needs to issue. Uh, so the weakness of, of the U.S. is there, I think. It's basically runaway government spending, runaway budget deficits, uh, and uh, the start of a demographic transition uh, with pension fa- pension plans all over the country that are very, very underfunded. Um, that's uh, that's the, the first key problem. The, I think the, the second key problem in the U.S. Uh, is one that uh, is well highlighted in, in all the media. Um and that is the, the runaway cost, and that goes hand in hand with the unfunded pension liabilities. But it's uh, it's the runaway cost of uh, of healthcare. You know, the U.S. spends roughly 18% of its GDP on healthcare. Um, compare that to any Western democracy, and uh, any Western democracy is uh, seven to uh, 11% of GDP. So the uh, this massive cost of healthcare is uh, is I think. Uh, obviously becoming a real political issue in the U.S. Uh, it is behind the rise of Bernie Sanders, uh, who uh, looks to me increasingly likely to be the, the U.S. Democratic presidential candidate. So, you know, I think you can make a case that, you know, the rising cost of health care, the unfunded pension liability uh, is leading to a rise of, uh, you know, an unbowed socialist. This is a guy who in 1988 uh, chose to spend his uh, honeymoon in the Soviet Union. Um, the, so not on, on about socialist, uh, to potentially be, uh, you know, the democratic candidate of the United States. So, uh, that's, that right there is the, the weakness, I think of, of the U S at this stage, runaway government spending, healthcare spending, uh, that's out of control and basically an increasingly broken, uh, political landscape. Yeah, it's always very interesting. And, uh, 
What do you think about, also, I, I, I gather from your book that you, you describe this field, the, the battlefield of technology, as a sort of a trap for the U.S., because where the U.S. is thinking that they may easily win, but uh, as you said, becoming a battlefield may end up in a sort of a disaster. Uh, and it's, it sounded like a precaution, like a warning to the, you know, uh, at least English-speaking world that seems to be easily convinced that the U.S. will easily win this confrontation with China. Do you support this opinion still? Did I pro properly uh, assume what you, what you wrote in the book? Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, when, when, when President Trump launched uh, the trade war, he said that, uh, you know, the uh, trade wars are very easy to win. Um, and, you know, that, that struck me as a little, little hubristic. Um, now, of course, every country that, uh, that ever, that's ever gone off to war Uh, usually goes off on on the premise that uh, we're going to win this one because otherwise you wouldn't go off to war, right? Uh, you know, all all the European powers in World War One uh, went off to war, uh, you know, believing that uh, this would be a done deal in three weeks. Um, and uh, instead, of course, the um, the World War One ended up Europe's uh, lo being Europe's long suicide note. And um, spelling the doom of, of every European empire, whether the Russian Empire, the Austrian Hungarian Empire, the Turkish Empire, um, and uh, and the German Empire, the Prussian Empire as well. So the you know the idea that you know let's let's start a war that that will uh, easily win. Um, you know I, I'm I'm always I think uh, history suggests that things are never quite that simple. Number one, um, number two, you know the the U.S. has Uh, throughout my lifetime, started a lot of wars, like real wars, physical wars, um, and hasn't had such a great great track record in in closing them out um, and and winning them. Um, so if you know if I were American, I you know given the the recent track record and the inability to close out and win wars, I'd be uh, I'd be reluctant to start new ones uh, on the premise that that they're easy to win. Um, And then, you know, finally, yes, to, to the point, and that's the point I make in your book and the point you, you, you raised here. Um, I think the U.S. decided to pick a war on the trade front um, because that is the U.S.'s main comparative advantage today. Uh, that is, you know, the, the core U.S. source of strength today is their utter dominance in the, uh, in the tech sector. Um, so it makes, you know, in a sense, you could say, well, given the U.S. domination of, uh, of the tech sector, it makes sense for the U.S. to want to pick the fight on that very battlefield. Um, it makes sense for the U.S. to say, hey, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick a fight here. Um, having said that, should they, should they lose uh, then uh, or should they struggle, uh, then they've really, um, then, they're, they're, then they'll be in trouble because, you know, you, you, you basically undermine the one very strong bit of your economy. Uh, you've uh, shaken investors' faith So I think, you know, what the U.S. is basically doing is playing a fairly high stakes game. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that makes a ton of long term long term sense, um, especially when you consider that, you know, if you look at the tech sector, the U.S. dominance is really linked to its ability to uh, to organize the ecosystem, uh, to organize the tech ecosystem. Uh, take Apple as an example. You know, a lot of the work is actually done in the factories of Foxconn in, in southern China, whether to create your iPhone or to create your iPads, etc. Uh, but a lot of the value added uh, flows to the U.S. It flows to Apple and to Apple shareholders. Um, so it's, you know, start, start um, moving that around and uh, who, knows, who knows where you end up. Um, it seems that because the other front you've mentioned is the financial front, and it would it would appear that the U.S., as you said, has picked picked all the battlefields, and yet the the, the financial front is a peculiar one because again the U.S. is very largely the creator has created has set up the, the international system with king dollar at at its at its helm, but it, this particular system seems to be under attack more by the United States, including the, the, the king dollar, which you said is, is, could abdicate. Um, why, what is the role of U.S. dollar uh, in, in the system for the United States as well, and why would the U.S. ever consider abdicating from, 
supplements from the government. Yeah, well, look, the um, that's a very important question, and that's a, that's a big part of the book. Um, you know, we the, the my starting point is the fact that the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency is by far the U.S.'s biggest comparative advantage. Um, and this was very clear to see in, uh, in 2008. You know, in 2008, when, uh, when you know, American banks and other banks around the world started to go bust, uh, started to go bankrupt, what you saw was the U.S. run massive twin deficits. Um, and, you know, the U.S. budget deficit uh, went up to like 8 or 9%, something like that. Um, but there was no problem for the U.S. to fund uh, this deficit. Um, now, compare that with Europe in uh, 2012, 2013. You know, when, when the budget deficits of countries in southern Europe and even France started to, uh, to run close to 5%, uh, basically – the market said, "Look, you know, you, you got to cut your spending, and I have no interest in uh, in funding you anymore." So, the the fact that America can always get its deficits funded because it is the reserve currency of the world, uh, again, is a massive comparative advantage, which basically allows the U.S. to uh, to still stimulate at the bottom of the economic cycles uh, and not have to take painful medicine uh, that other economic countries. Uh, I've had to take uh, over the uh, over the past uh, few years. Whether you look at the case of the Asian crisis, of the European crisis, of Russia in '98, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so the uh, no. So again, U.S. dollar as a reserve currency is 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 key to uh, I would say to the U.S. economic uh, dominance. Um, now, to your point, I think recent years uh, have shown. Really, American policymakers underestimating the importance of this, um, because what you've seen is increasingly the I would say the U.S. State Department and the U.S. National Security Establishment um, weaponize the U.S. dollar. Basically, use the U.S. dollar as the stick to uh, through which they can beat up uh, their their uh, uh, geostrategic op uh, opponents. So, you know, you saw it uh, basically in the case of Sudan, you saw it in the case of Iran, uh, you saw it in the case of Russia, um, and it was even threatened uh, in the case of China. That basically, look, the, the way the U.S. now does foreign policy is do as you're told uh, or, you know, we won't, um, we won't allow your banks, we won't allow your citizens, we won't allow your companies to use uh, U.S. dollars. Um, and... Uh, you saw this uh, the first time you really saw this with, with Sudan and the U.S. Treasury uh, basically saying, look, uh, telling BNP, the French bank, if you're going to lend dollars to Sudan, uh, then you're in breach of U.S. rules. Um, and any deal that gets done in U.S. dollars, we, the U.S. Treasury, uh, have a right to look into it and see if it confirms to, uh, to, to U.S. rules. So it now means that you know if you and I do a deal together – um, and that deal is in U.S. dollars, then the U.S. authorities uh, maintain the right to go look at that deal, even though I'm French and you're Polish uh, and neither of us is, uh, is, is Americans. If we trade in U.S. dollars, we now fall under U.S. Uh, laws. Um, and so to a lot of countries, this is becoming, you know, rather uh, um, unenticing. Um, and so especially since the U.S. keeps using the dollar to flex its muscles. So if you're China, if you're Russia, if you're a lot of countries that with whom the U.S. has a complicated relationship, the obviously the uh, the desire is to reduce your dependency on the U.S. dollar and do trades in other currencies, do trades in renminbi, do trades in ruble, do trades in euros, do trades in anything, but but the U.S. dollar uh, basically make sure that you you never get to be under the thumb of uh, of the U.S. Treasury. Um, and so the more the U.S. you know weaponizes the U.S. dollar, I think the more countries will start to think, hold on, uh, maybe I should uh, be doing trade in another uh, another currency. Now, as things stand, the U.S. dollar is still the overwhelming uh, world reserve currency. Um, my bet is, and I talk about that in the book, is that over the next 10 years, this will gradually change uh, and that other rival trading currencies will emerge, not least of which, of course, the renminbi. Yeah, again, very interesting point. Uh, uh, I just, uh, I'm just thinking, and uh, uh, 
whether this uh, you know Astana announcement of new new Silk Road, the Belt and Road Initiative by Xi Jinping in 2013 uh, was a sort of a you know forecast, geopolitical forecast on on the part of the Chinese ruling elites that. They understood that this rise could not last forever, and sooner or later the Americans w- would notice that, and they will use all the leverages they have to stop it, including the, the power of the world ocean, uh, where strategic flow, uh, flows occur. And, and we wrote about the strategy in the future. The United States would have to weaponize the dollar system and uh, use all other leverages, uh, uh, infringing the, memora- the, the Cross Memorandum. You know the famous growth memorandum yep. uh, that the system should be open because what you're saying is that the Americans are trying to curtail the system, the openness of the system, and I understand that the Chinese are trying to sort of uh, evade this uh, this loop, this trap by 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 building the new supply chain across Eurasia. What do you think? How is how is it progressing? Are they successful so far, the Chinese, with this project? How 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 do you because there are co- really conflicting opinions about it including here in europe uh, where i think europe is on the on the verge of making decisions just strategic decisions as a whole what what, what is your take on that yeah no look i think you're, you're absolutely right uh, you know the big challenge when you look at china is it, it often feels like it's three steps forwards and two steps back um and that uh you know so as you look at, at policy unfold you're it, you know sometimes it looks as things as are, are getting better and often it, uh, you know, you're like, well, actually, this this is going the wrong way. Um, now, you know, when you look at the story of the RMB internationalization uh, at China gradually opening up its capital controls, as China uh, making it easier and better for for foreign uh, investors to invest in its domestic markets, which is necessary if you want to replace the U.S. dollar as Asia's trading currency. Um, you know, I think this year we have to acknowledge that uh, there was a, a setback, uh, which is obviously the situation that, that unfolded in Hong Kong. Um, I think for China, Hong Kong was a, is a key piece in this uh, international, internationalization of the renminbi. It's, uh, it's a key piece in, uh, in the gradual opening up capital controls. Uh, it's in, you can almost say it's the, the laboratory through which China can experiment um, and you know, move, move the dial uh, somewhat, um, and then if uh, reform works with Hong Kong, then you can open it up to the rest of the world. Uh, now, of course, uh, as as you you you'll know, the past well seven or eight months uh, have been marred with you know big protests in Hong Kong, um, big uncertainty as to Hong Kong's political future, um, and with that, you know this has stalled. You you were seeing starting to see really a, a <coughs> excuse me, you were seeing an opening up of of capital controls through Hong Kong. And the past seven or eight months, everything has, has stalled because of, of the uncertainty created here. Um, you know, looking forward, what does this mean? It means, I think, one of two things. Uh, either Hong Kong starts to get better once again, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the opening up can, can go through Hong Kong uh, once more and reaccelerate, option one. Option two, uh, Hong Kong continues to be a mess, and that will force China to try and replace Hong Kong with Shanghai. And... Um, replacing Hong Kong with Shanghai, of course, also means uh, opening up capital controls. So uh, I, m- my guess is that the coming year should see some, uh, some interesting reforms one way or the other, um, but that uh, you know, we shouldn't blind ourselves to the fact that the, the situation in Hong Kong has meant that the past six months probably hasn't seen the pace of reform that we would have expected uh, before, basically when we wrote the book. As, as we are speaking to you uh, over the internet now, we're sitting in, in Warsaw, uh, in, uh, right? Uh, by the way, do you know that we are halfway between Beijing and Washington, D.C., and it's 200 kilometers closer to Beijing from Warsaw than to Washington, D.C., and you can walk? I did not know that. Oh. So I checked it a year ago. and yeah, that, that China, was, uh, China's got, uh, you know, is very keen on its relationship with Poland, uh, and, uh, that you know, it sees Poland, Hungary, and Czechia as... Uh, important components of the one belt one road uh that you know it's basically the the bridgehead into europe um so uh and you know poland's a big market in its own right uh i didn't realize though that it was equidistant from beijing to uh to washington that's funny yeah that's funny that is funny true 
Uh, what do you think? What you you're, you wrote a beautiful chapter in your book about the European Empire, which I found uh, overwhelming in in accuracy. Uh, and I advocated I advocated this position of yours here in Poland and the region, uh, especially as being a sort of a peripheria, yeah, to to you know as opposed to the Brussels and uh, Ruhrgebiet and so on, yeah, in, 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 yeah. in Germany. Uh, what is your uh, what is your opinion? What Europe will do, seeing this contest of giants of China and US, what Germany and France will do, and what how it will impact the European Union. Well, so so uh, look, I think the first question, you know, when you ask what will Europe do, um, I think that's a very important question because, um, you know, is Europe going to speak of one voice on this, um, or will you have? very divided um, opinions. Um, you know, I think if you look at economically um, and culturally, um, countries like Britain and France have uh, always been turned towards the Atlantic, of course, and always been turned towards the United States. And that when push comes to shove, uh, England and France sort of have a history of always falling uh, in line with, uh, with the U.S. Um, The same isn't always true, I think, for, for China and, and, of course, for Eastern Europe. And, and uh, uh, Sorry, the same isn't true uh, as well for Germany uh, and, and for Eastern Europe. Um, and, you know, if you look at Germany today, uh, economically, is Germany's future more about selling cars and machine tools to the U.S. or is it more about selling cars and machine tools to, to China? Um, What do you think? What do you think? Well, so... You know, I think actually within Europe, the different countries will have very different economic interests, very different cultural interests, very different reactions to the to the unfolding uh, breakdown in the U.S.-China relationship. Um, as a result, I think the default mode in Europe will be: let's try not to take a stance on this. Uh, let's agree to basically, you know, brush this under the rug, not take a stance, uh, and basically be as neutral as 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 we can possibly be. Um, Partly because you know with, within Europe you'll have very very uh, I think uh, different voices. Uh, countries like Germany will want to uh, probably fall in, under the, the the Chinese side of things, and and countries like France uh, the other way. Um, and of course, what we know from from uh, you know the history of the European Union over the past 30, 40 years um, is that if France and Germany tend to not agree on something, then then typically nothing happens. Uh, now you could say this is the past. Uh, now, you know, the voting blocks have changed. Uh, you, uh, you know, have the Visegrad group and Eastern Europe is, is a much bigger block than, uh, than, it, than it's ever been. And so, uh, you know, Germany plus Eastern Europe could easily drown out France, uh, especially now that Britain, uh, is walking out. Uh, so that's, you know, one, one possibility for sure. Uh, my, My belief, though, is whenever it comes to foreign relations, uh, Germany, because of its own history, is uh, is always reluctant to uh, to take any courageous stance and re really reluctant to uh, to make a splash on anything. So my guess is Europe will try to remain as neutral as they possibly can. Be before I ask you, what would you do if you acted on behalf of Poland, my country? I will give you the three options that Poland is facing, and it is sort of debated these days. The option one, number one, is stick to U.S., hope that U.S. would win and restore its primacy in the system, and we, would, we could get some supply chain that will, that will be moved from China and elsewhere to Poland and Central and Eastern Europe, and we would uh, get uh, military assistance. And we would be a sort of an independent uh, Uh, poll in the European system supported by the sea power of the United States. So this is option number one and it's right now very much liked by the Polish politicians uh, that are at power in power. Option number two is stick to the growing European empire, especially with Germany, and uh, adjust to the Mittel Europa system of German economy and its subcontractors in Central, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and we call it a, a, a peace party. Peace Party. I mean, the, the party that wants, you know, thinks that it, that will secure the peaceful development. And option number three is strategic patience and independence is cooperating with everybody, waiting for the, you know, the final contours of the new system to, to show up 
uh, so cooperating with European Union, Germany, United States, and China, case by case, uh, depending how it all evolves. Yeah. What would you, what, which way would you go? Um, I think I hate, uh, I don't want to be a Jesuit priest and answer your questions with another question, but uh, it all, I think the answer really depends on um, how you feel about Russia. Um, and, you know, I think if you're Polish and you feel that Russia is a big threat uh, to you in the future, which, you know, based on history, there's reasons to think that. Um, if you think that Russia is a big threat to you in the future, then you really have no choice but to choose number one. Um, if you actually think, you know, that Russia is really a, a paper tiger, that it makes a lot of noise, but that fundamentally uh, it's because of its economic system being a bit of a mess, uh, its reach is really, you know, not, not that great. Uh, then uh, option number three makes uh, makes a whole lot more sense. Um, I, I would say, you know, personally speaking, I, I tend to be, uh, I would tend to argue for option number three. Um, I don't believe, you know, Russia's, uh, you know, set to uh, to to invade Poland, uh, and as a result, I'm not quite convinced that Poland needs to, uh, you know, bend over backwards to please the U.S. in order to uh, to ensure itself U.S. protection. Um, but I, I can understand that you know people have a different view on this, uh, given again uh, the weight of history, uh, given the fact that you know just uh, twenty or thirty years ago you had uh, Soviet troops uh, in Poland. I can see how you know this cast a long shadow and uh, brings back a lot of you know bad memories for a lot of people. So um, to me, it's either option one or option three, depending on you know your perception of Russia as a threat. Um, option two really doesn't bring very much to the table, I think. Interesting, very interesting. You know what you're saying is there is a really hot debate among you know the sort of elites in Poland about. And then sometimes I think that majority opts for, for option number two, which is uh, what you have not picked. And uh, why, why, why would you substantiate why you think it's not bringing anything to the table? It's not well, look, us? Option, option number two basically means more greater economic integration with Germany uh, and with the European Union uh, at a time where we know that this is basically the one part of the world from which you're getting ze absolutely zero growth, right? The uh, Germany uh, and the rest of the Eurozone uh, is basically uh, an economic corpse uh, with crazy monetary policies of negative interest rates, which are basically destroying European savings. Uh, and w you, you can't hope that anything com good comes out of destroying savings. Uh, you know, you know in, in, in the greater Eurozone, we are now at a stage at a stage where everything is being sacrificed to ensure that the European currency doesn't implode. So every price, whether the exchange rate, the uh, the interest rate, every price is being falsified. Um, and when you falsify every price, um, and that was of course the experience of the Soviet Union, you basically uh, create uh, all sorts of havoc for your economic system, uh, and which can never properly adjust. Um, now you know on, on this on this story of the savings being decimated, um, I think you're seeing already some of the consequences of that through the massive demonstrations that you're seeing in France right now. Uh, basically, pensioners not able to make ends meet, um, and that's just the start. You're going to see the same thing all over Europe. You know, French people are always quick to demonstrate, but the destruction of European savings is not a French thing. It's a, it's a pan-European thing, uh, and again, this basically announces the the death of, uh, of European economies. So I don't really see the need to, uh, to tie yourself in with that when you have uh, a fast growing U S economy, a fast growing Russian economy, a fast growing Chinese economy. Uh, to me, these are, are much more attractive, uh, economic partners than, uh, than the more of European corpse. So <clears throat> basically between the two, because I would imagine the goal here would be to improve our, our position in the I can, I'm in sorry the, to interrupt, but I can barely hear you. Okay, so basically, well, between the the other two options, I would imagine the ultimate goal would be to improve our standing within the global um, supply chain, without, within the division of labor, where we're currently relegated to a, to a fairly modest position of semi-periphery. So the pardon for using Wallerstein to, to, to justify it. So out of the two, 
to simplify China and the U.S., which camp do you think gives us better possibility to improve our, our, our standing within the, the, the global supply chain division of labor? Oh, look, I think it's it's no doubt that it's uh, that it's China. Look, I think if you're Poland, uh, the big challenge is that uh, you've basically been a landlocked country. Now, I know you're not landlocked because you're on the Baltic Sea, uh, but the Baltic Sea has really been historically a lake uh, and um, more or less controlled by, by Germany. So, you know, I think if you're, if you're Poland in the past, you know, 15, 20 years, uh, you, the challenge you've had is your only possible economic integration with the rest of the world, you basically had to go through Germany. Um, and so you had, you, you were confronted to the challenge of any landlocked country where because you're economically dependent on Germany, it's pretty hard to have, uh, you know, a, a a hundred percent independent policies on on everything. Um, what uh, what China offers today, of course, is to break this landmark um, through the you know through the one belt one road through the uh, new roads, new railways, new telecom lines, new everything um, to basically break that dependency that uh, that you've had on Germany. Um, and you know it's it's always better to have options, right? Um, you know. Doing more stuff with China uh, and, frankly, doing more stuff with Russia uh, for Poland does not mean that you don't have you can't do stuff with Germany anymore. Uh, but it means that you're no longer 100% dependent on Germany, and that's got to be a, a positive development. Um, going back to, to to what you've said before when you were answering Jacek's question, you've mentioned that Europe has insane uh, negative interest rates. And I've listened to, to, to your conversation recently when you've said pretty much all over the world, this is the case all over the world, with the exception of China. And China is one of those countries that doesn't and also, you know, announced that it will not engage in a thorough QE and it won't follow the path that it did in 20, 2008 and then I think 2016. Um, what, does, what does it say of the Chinese planners, of their, of their vision of avoiding the, what seems to be a global, global slowdown? Well, to be honest, economy. I think it goes hand in hand with what uh, we were discussing before, this idea that uh, China needs to reduce its dependency on the U.S. dollar, basically needs to transform the renminbi into a trade uh, and reserve currency in its own right. Uh, and of course, if China manages to do that, that's a tremendous comparative advantage because then you start settling your trade in your own currency, right? I mean, you know, if you're China today, the, the first big challenge is that if you want to buy, um, uh, if you want to buy foreign goods, you uh, you first have to earn the U.S. dollars, then you can buy foreign goods. Uh, if you can settle these foreign goods in renminbi, of course, then you, the world's your oyster. You can always print the renminbi. So. You know, transforming your current your currency into uh, into a reserve currency into a trade currency is a huge advantage. Um, and I think you know, if you're China today, you probably think I've got a, a window here, a time window, which is uh, perhaps pretty good to do it because while Europe, while the U.S., while Japan, while everybody's trying to debase the currency, I can come in uh, as Egong did. Uh, Egong being the the uh, People's Bank of China governor, the central bank governor of China. Uh, came out with a very hawkish speech in December of last year, December 2019, saying, look, uh, we will not follow Western countries into doing quantitative easing. We will not follow Western countries into doing zero interest rate policies or negative interest rate policies. Uh, maintaining positive interest rates is a key part uh, of the Chinese saving culture and uh, and is thus beneficial to the economy. Uh, this is, So today China has a sort of a great window to present itself as the one country uh, that is not going to debase its currency as the one country where saving uh, in that currency makes sense um, and uh, and it, where trading in that currency makes sense. And so that's, um, you know, I think China is going down this path and it's, uh, it's you know, one of the reasons I'm, I'm personally fairly optimistic on the, uh, the return outlook for both renminbi assets and, uh, and RMB bonds. Mm -hmm. And as you know, we are will be slowly wrapping up. Uh, uh, I think it will be my last question. Uh, you know, what would be your rough judgment where we will be in ten years' time in term in terms of the global outlook? Uh, I think that's uh, uh, that's obviously a, the you know the very important question. Um, look, I think we're heading to a world where 
you're really going to have three major economic zones. Um, a, an America zone uh, where the trade and reserve currency will be the U.S. dollar uh, with its own supply chain. So increasingly the supply chain feeding the United States will be uh, based in Mexico and in uh, Canada and, of course, back in the U.S. itself um, with an American worker that, uh, that you know, uh, gets jobs again and, and higher wages and all these things. Um, you'll have a European zone uh, with its own reserve currency, the euro. It's uh, probably fairly weak economic growth. Um, and really, actually, its economic growth will perhaps a lot depend on exports to, uh, to the other two zones, m- mostly Asia and, and the U.S. Um, and then you'll have uh, an Asian economic zone uh, centered around China uh, with the renminbi as a reserve currency where supply lines will have been rearranged no longer to cater to a U.S. consumer, but to cater to a pan-emerging market consumer, because part of this Asian economic zone will most likely include Africa as well. When you look at the amount of money that uh, China's pouring into Africa, and frankly, the number of people that are going down there. Um, and so, yeah, you'll have a world split in three zones with three reserve currencies, three re- reference bond markets, uh, three supply chains, um, and... Yeah, that that'll, that'll be the world. It doesn't mean that it's a world that you know heads towards wars or or crises, etc. It's uh, yeah, but it's a world where you 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 know you you need to readjust a lot of uh, of what uh, what occurred over the past decade. Uh, you know, a few years ago, people were talking about Chin America as one big economic block. This is this is now over. You you will now have a world a world with three separate economic blocks. Again, each with their own reserve currency, reference bond market, and supply chains. Again, one of the final questions, but I, I, I've noticed that there was there were plenty. I'm sorry for the silly introduction. There are plenty of graphs, but only one, only one picture uh, in your book, and I think this ties back to to China avoiding inflation. And I wanted to ask you about what what, what is the China's view on the on the Tiananmen, and because I, I, it would appear that in Poland or in general in, in Europe, it's a very oversimplified and, and granular description of the event. Yeah. So, could you, could you was, tell us what happened then? Yeah. The, you know, if I think if you're a Westerner, you you know you look at Tiananmen and you view this as, uh, you know, young Chinese students, of course, fighting up for their rights, fighting for democracy, uh, trying to change the political system in China, and obviously the political system uh, uh, lashing back. Um, the the reason for the violence of the lashing back, we have to remember that. Uh, you know, 15 years before you had the Cultural Revolution in China, and that a lot of the guys who were leaders in China um, had had a horrible time during the, the Cultural Revolution. And the Cultural Revolution was mostly, you know, the students uh, wrecking havoc and uh, putting older people in jail and sending sending one another to the countryside um, to, you know, work the, the fields with their bare hands. Um, so, you know, the first, the first thing to acknowledge when you, the Chinese leadership uh, pa- probably panicked and thought, oh my God, here comes another cultural revolution. We got to, you got to nip this in the bud. Number one. Number two. Uh, when you talk to Chinese policymakers today, the general view of Tiananmen is that uh, the catalyst for it wasn't as much a desire for freedom or democracy or any or anything like that, but that instead uh, it was all linked to inflation, uh, which is a very Marxist view of of the world, right? If you're a Marxist, you tend to believe that uh, uh, revolutions and Big historical changes are the result not of um, ideas or individuals, but are really triggered by economic uh, forces, and that there's no more powerful economic force than inflation. Um, so, if you're Chinese uh, today, you know the mantra is kind of is sort of that the, the Tiananmen was because at the time you had 20% inflation in China, so people were unhappy, so they demonstrated, and uh, and then you had the the backlash triggered by the fear that this was a new culture revolution. Now, um, this matters, of course, because today, yeah, inflation in China is accelerating, of course. And in the Chinese worldview, uh, just as inflation is, is picking up uh, in food prices, just as inflation is picking up in oil prices, after all, oil was up 35% last year, you're seeing riots in France and Barcelona and Beirut and Cairo and Santiago and Hong Kong. So this all converts their worldview, the Marxist worldview, that you know inflation is this deeply de- destabilizing force. Um, and so this means, uh, you know, going back to the fact that the Chinese central bank uh, 
unlike any other central bank, is actually trying to maintain the value of its currency today. Uh, I think this this partly explains it. Uh, that you know, China will will the Chinese central bank today uh, is probably the only hawkish central bank left in the world. And the final one here, uh, with the again, with, for example, the global global debt and far exceeding the global GDP, and uh, no end in sight, seemingly to, to to this with the with the quantitative easing happening. Um, I've, I've stumbled upon an opinion that the only way to really manage this going into 2020s would be to, at some point in time, uh, just uh, reset the debts to simply because they will simply be not payable. Do, do you view this in any way? What, what, what is your view of the of the economic outlook, the, the likelihood of, of, of serious asymmetric shocks happening, and and then followed by by abolishment of all of or parts of global debt? <laughs> Well, I think here it, it all depends who, who owns the debt, right? And, and um, mm-hmm. you know, you have countries that run uh, large current account surpluses um, where you've had a big increase in debt and all that debt is owned by local savers and or the local central bank. Um, this is, you know, a prime example here is Japan. So, for example, Japan, you know, as the uh, central bank buys more and more of the debt, Japan could conceptually, you know, cancel a lot of that debt uh, with very limited uh, macro impact. Um, of course, the situation is different for a country like France or a country like the U.S., where uh, a lot of the debt is actually held by foreigners. Um, because if you uh, and you know that's because you're, you're running current account deficits. Um, if if the debt is held by foreigners and you say, okay, I'm just going to cancel this debt, uh, obviously you're in default. Uh, number one, uh, but more importantly, it leads to your currency uh, absolutely tanking. Uh, the reason foreigners held your debt in the first place is you were running a current account deficits. And so, you know, with the money that they earned selling you stuff, they just thought, all right, I'll just buy debt with it um, until I figure out what to do with it. Um, if you start canceling it, needless to say, then uh, nobody's going to be interested in selling you stuff for your currency. Uh, and so, you know, for countries, for the countries that run current account deficits, um, I don't think you can d- delude yourself that canceling the debt won't have big macro implications. The first one of which will be, of course, a collapse in your currency. Um, and as we know, like collapse in the currencies trigger uh, more capital flight. It feeds onto itself. Um, it leads to uh, to weaker growth and higher inflation, i.e. a very suboptimal macroeconomic environment. Great. Thank you so much, Louis. This was an absolute treat for us, and I'm sure it will be a treat for thank our viewers. You. So thank you again. For your time. Thank you so much. It was a, a pleasure to be on, and uh, have a very, very great uh, 2020. Best of luck. Yeah, you too. I you hope too. we'll have a chance to do it again, run it again at some point in time. But, uh, Absolutely. Then, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.